What kind of cop are you? This is the tagline to the 2019 computer role-playing game Disco Elysium. From the outset, the player controls a police detective awakening from a days-long bender. Because of his hard living or some other unseen force, the detective has amnesia. Everything from his personal identity to his knowledge of the world has been erased, save for some rudimentary knowledge like how to walk, talk, and be horrified at the unceasing nightmare of existence. You know, normal stuff. The detective, revealed to be named Harry, is in town because he has been tasked with solving a murder. He's only aware of this because his assigned partner from another police district, Kim Kitsuragi, tells him so and acts as a sounding board and encyclopedia throughout the gameplay. Because of Harry's tabula rasa status, he can be instilled with any number of personality traits, beliefs, and political ideologies. The game keeps track of these decisions, these new thoughts and ideas. Harry is a mess. Total garbage. At least once referring to himself as a hobo cop. I felt sorry for Harry, and in my first run through the game, I tried to have him make good choices so that he could both solve the murder and become a better man. Because of this, by the end of the game, the mystery was solved, he had impressed Kim, and he was a full-blown communist. All very good things. My initial run through Disco Elysium, hereafter called the Communist Run, transformed Harry from a blank slate to someone who questioned the very authority bestowed upon him, concluding that hierarchical systems are oppressive and that power does not justify itself. Though the game had no such designation, Harry resembled a left anarchist by the end. He consistently called into question the authority of the police, sometimes thoughtfully and sometimes through slogans like F*** the police. What kind of cop I am is one that is skeptical of the overall goodness of the police, particularly as agents of capitalism. Police have far too much authority over our lives, and the motives of those who control the laws and consequently law enforcement are suspect. I put the game down once it reached its rather abrupt ending, and a few weeks later, I came back to it. Disco Elysium is an excellent game. One of a kind and the diversity of options and choices makes for a new game during every playthrough. I thought to myself, what if I gave Harry the opposite of my politics and values this time? What if my cop behaved like a cop? What if Harry embodied all the trappings of modern law enforcement? I did that, and by the end he was a fascist and an enthusiastic bootlicker of capitalists. This is how it happened, and why all hobo cops are best. In the beginning of my fascist run, Harry woke up on the floor, drunk, tired, and without a memory. Of course, that's the way the game always starts. My choices began to affect him later. In Disco Elysium, the outcomes of all choices are determined by dice rolls. I failed two extremely difficult checks, dressed Harry, and had him leave his hotel room. Harry met Klaja, a woman staying at the hotel, although they had met before in the fog of his pre-amnesia life. She addressed him as officer. In my communist run, upon learning this, I made Harry incredulous, but trying to make Harry behave more like every encounter with the police I've had, I made Harry say, I'm a policeman, and don't you forget it. As we'll see throughout the game and this video, police officers have institutional support that allow them to conduct themselves aggressively, or however they want, so long as it's within the line of duty. Since Harry is here on assignment, as we'll soon learn, Almost nothing he says or does will result in failing the game. When I say that Harry has institutional support, it means that his actions are broadly endorsed by both society and those who have the greatest power within society. When a police officer does something wrong, much of the public will leap to their defense, shouting down any opposition with platitudes and dog whistles like law and order more than fleshed out reasonable arguments. The people believe in the overall goodness of the police due to propaganda and rhetoric by those with the power to spread said propaganda and rhetoric. This makes public outcry about police wrongdoing tempered by a society that sees police going over the line as an inevitability of the profession and a means justified by its ends. Those with power in society, meaning the wealthy and the politicians, endorse the police because they protect private property and the state respectively their two interests. Everything I had Harry say to the woman was pointed and aggressive. 
I made an extremely difficult skill check and tried to have Harry coerce her into an intimate act. There were no consequences for this inappropriate behavior in the game, and few consequences in the real world. For example, the New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board, an independent New York City agency that investigated civilian complaints of misconduct by NYPD officers, for decades automatically referred police sexual misconduct complaints to the NYPD for internal examination. In other words, police misconduct is investigated by the entity that allegedly performed the misconduct. All misconduct by the police, so long as the misconduct happens in the line of duty, is handled internally. And with the aforementioned public trust of police due to propaganda and rhetoric by those in power, there is rarely any real pressure for misconduct to lead to firing and charges pressed against the police officer. Anyone who has ever interacted with a police officer understands this lopsided power dynamic. When police officers engage in sexual misconduct, they are taking advantage of this imbalance, whether they know it or not. A police officer even asking for a victim's phone number has significantly more power in this interaction, as the victim saying no could negatively affect her case. Harry's attempt to sleep with the woman utilizes this imbalance of power dynamics. Harry has been on duty ever since arriving in Martinet. He's there to investigate a murder. That means all his flirtations and exploits since arriving have been under the authority of a police officer and not simply a man who likes to party and listen to disco music. Not all police misconduct is sexual, but all police misconduct operates under an imbalance of power. Internal investigations into misconduct may be done by a different department than the one that employs the offending officer, as different cities and countries perform internal affairs differently. However, police everywhere either belong to a fraternal order or are instilled with enough camaraderie that the wheels of justice move very slowly, if at all, for victims of police misconduct, sexual or otherwise. After Klaja makes her escape, I had Harry bang on the door over and over again, being aggressive and vulgar. There are no legal consequences for Harry if he does this. To sum up, police are granted enormous authority by those in power, and their authority can very easily be abused with far fewer consequences than those of civilians. It's a kind of cycle of power. Those with wealth and influence make the people believe the police are on their side, which protects the police, who in turn abuse their power in service of protecting those with wealth and influence. More on all of these topics later and in far greater detail. For now, back to the game. I decided to make Harry a smoker because I wanted him to make nothing but bad decisions. Afterward, I had him walk downstairs to begin his day. Harry flexed his newfound authority with Gart, the cafeteria manager, and found his assigned partner, Kim Kitsuragi. Kim told Harry that they work in different precincts, but they are to work together on this case. So, where does all this authority come from? When and where did this cycle of power begin? How did it spread? And how does it function to control people, most notably the poor? Not in the fictional world of Disco Elysium, but the real world. Some form of law enforcement has existed for roughly as long as communal society has existed. Their duties, level of power, centralization, dynamics, and what systems they serve vary over time. The word constable, for example, is derived from comestabili, meaning head of the stables or count of the stables, and has existed since the 9th century. Law enforcement varied from place to place across the globe. Rural law enforcement in medieval England was conducted by Shire Reeves, who were both tax collectors and soldiers. This is where the word sheriff is derived. However, a centralized police force is a fairly recent invention. Policing in the United States had its origins in policing from England. The watch system in the American colonies was composed of volunteers whose duties were mainly that of warning the town of impending danger. Boston, for example, created a night watch in 1636. New York followed decades later in 1658, and Philadelphia in 1700. The night watch was kind of a law enforcement agency, but it was primarily employed by people trying to evade military service or as punishment. In addition, there were constables, but law enforcement was only one of their duties. 
They also surveyed land and verified the accuracy of weights and measures. They weren't so much cops as they were officials with a lot of barely related jobs to do. It wasn't until the 1830s that a centralized police force was created in northern cities in the United States. As explained by Dr. Gary Potter of Eastern Kentucky University, these modern police organizations shared similar characteristics. They were publicly supported and bureaucratic in form. Police officers were full-time employees, not community volunteers or case-by-case fee retainers. Departments had permanent and fixed rules and procedures, and employment as police officers was continuous. Police departments were accountable to a central government authority. In the southern United States, the origins of the police were different. In 1704, the first slave patrols were formed. Again from Dr. Potter. Slave patrols had three primary functions. To chase down, apprehend, and return to their owners, runaway slaves. To provide a form of organized terror to deter slave revolts and to maintain a form of discipline for slave workers who were subject to summary justice, outside of the law, if they violated any plantation rules. Not all modern policing has its origins in slave patrols, but some of it definitely does. Modern policing in other countries had different origins, but followed similar paths. Centralized modern policing had its origins in Europe, but was adopted across the world. Without going into every single nation's evolution into a modern centralized police force, suffice it to say, in the 19th century, the world moved law enforcement in this direction. So, what about the world in the 19th century necessitated this development of centralized police forces? Cities were growing, sure, but evidence of an actual crime wave is severely lacking. If policing exists to correct disorder, then we have to understand who is defining these terms. Disorder was defined by capitalists. Through taxes and political influence, they supported the development of modern policing. Capitalists required a method in which to ensure the control of their workforce, their laborers. In short, Modern policing began as a means of opposing emerging unions and workers' rights, protecting property, controlling people as property, and protecting the state from unrest by the people. In other words, the police exist to control the poor. Private property interests increased parallel to the rise of the modern police. The police exist because of capitalism. In Disco Elysium, Kim Kitsuragi exists as the straight-laced police officer who believes in his cause. The topic of the police as a force to control the poor and protect private property comes up when Harry asks him what the police even are, but Kim rejects this as cynical because that is his function and role in the game. During my communist run, Harry rejected Kim's naivete, masked as altruism, and frequently questioned his own role as a police officer. In my fascist run, Harry rejected Kim's altruism only because he wanted to go in the opposite direction. He wanted to control the poor. He worked for the wealthy elite all while shouting, I am the law. In spite of Kim's protestations that the police do not exist for such purpose, he never actually tries to prevent Harry from doing any of this, seeing it as in service of his police work. By acknowledging it as police work, Kim is tacitly admitting that serving the interests of the wealthy and controlling the poor is, in fact, police work. From the 12th to 15th century, European medieval feudal society was based on a series of regionally based, largely self-supporting economic systems. This was called feudalism, a political and economic system where a landowner granted a place on the land to a vassal in exchange for homage and military service. Each self-supported region was a kind of mini-economy, where peasants were forced to work the land for a feudal lord in exchange for the right to build shelter on and work on a small strip of land. Although they were allowed to cultivate this strip of land, they had to give up a portion of their produce to the lord. If they could afford to keep animals on it, they had to hand over some of the gains from that as well. The feudal system began to break down in the beginning of the 16th century. Increased foreign trade led to the emergence of a new class of merchant capitalists. 
These new merchants managed to hoard wealth by purchasing foreign goods cheaply and selling them for huge profits to the European aristocracy. This led to many European countries growing rich from taxes and establishing colonies. Once a country established a colony, it imposed a trading monopoly, often by force, by banning foreign merchants and ships. The Solidarity Federation explained it thusly. For example, the riches of Spanish colonies in the Americas could only be exported to Spain, where they were traded on to other European countries at a tremendous markup, enriching both Spanish merchants and the Spanish state. The race for new colonies inevitably led to conflict. England, being a relative latecomer to the international trade race, found that many of the prime sources of wealth had already been snapped up, so it embarked on nearly three centuries of war to establish its own colonial empire. This is only a summary of centuries of economics, of course. In simplest terms, capitalism is the private ownership of the means of production. The means of production are both the facilities and resources for producing goods. For example, the factory and the resources in the factory that makes whatever it is the factory makes. Capitalism operates through wage labor. A worker sells their labor for a wage that is far less than what the owner, or capitalist, earns from that labor. Basically, a worker under capitalism makes dozens of loaves of bread to be able to afford only one loaf of bread. This is why opponents of capitalism often call wage labor wage slavery or remark that the relationship between worker and capitalist under capitalism is not too dissimilar from the relationship between serf and lord under feudalism. This is called exploitation, but under capitalism this is not only tolerated but encouraged. Exploitation is not the result of cheating capitalism, but the result of adhering to capitalism. Under capitalism, as the wealthy elite grow richer and richer, the workers do not. Instead, capitalists simply hire more workers at roughly the same wages. The increased profits that the capitalists make are then put back into production, where they grow richer still, and then they repeat the process. By doing this, the capitalists continue to accumulate wealth while the workers, the poor and middle class, do not accumulate wealth. Exploitation is baked into the economic system. It is the logic of capitalism itself. Capitalism does not lift many people out of poverty. In fact, capitalism relies on poverty to exist. In order for rich capitalists to be rich, they require a much greater number of poor people to perform wage labor for their industry. Poverty is not a bug in the system, it's a feature. It's an unavoidable component of capitalism. Private property and personal property are different. Personal property is your television set, your trash can, your shampoo, all things a single person would reasonably use on their own. When I open up Harry's inventory in Disco Elysium, his items are his personal property. Private ownership, however, is different. It's the ownership of something that a single person could not realistically use on their own, and something the entire community needs and depends on. For example, in Disco Elysium, Joyce works for the Wild Pines Group, a huge corporation controlling 22 cargo terminals and employing 72,000 wage laborers. Martinet depends on the Wild Pines Corporation, but under capitalism, it is privately owned, not collectively or publicly owned, and the people are forced to perform wage labor for Wild Pines to live. This is not some invention of an alternate timeline sci-fi computer game. That is how capitalism works. When the world became industrialized, capitalists required even more laborers, and eventually laborers wisely began to organize, and the capitalists tried to organize society around greater control of laborers and greater protection of their private property. A centralized police ensured the control of the workforce. Personal property is a given under any economic system. Private property, however, is something enforced through capitalism. Specifically, it's armed enforcers, the police. I had Harry go outside and begin the investigation. As this was my second playthrough, I knew more about what to do this time and immediately found the body. A hanged man, tied to a tree. In my communist run, Harry's starting stats were more geared toward empathy, 
but in this run, Harry had enough endurance to make a still unlikely check to approach the body without throwing up. The yard with the body was also home to Kuno and his adoptive sister of sorts, Kuno S. Kuno is a foul-mouthed child with a love of amphetamines and meaningless conflict. He's 12 years old. During my communist run, after a few days, I managed to make an empathy check, allowing for Harry and Kuno to get along better. Kuno has had a hard life. His impoverished father turned to alcoholism and such to dull the pain of living in poverty under capitalism, and Kuno himself took after his father. That was the communist run, though. Playing as a more natural enforcer of capitalism in which the poor are to be controlled, Harry punched Kuno for getting out of line. As for Kuno S., a 10-year-old girl, for the crime of interfering with police business and getting under Harry's skin... Oh, shit. Harry can perform a lot of underhanded and illegal actions throughout the game, and the game can continue. Successfully making the legendary roll and taking out Kuno S is one of the only actions that immediately stops the game, simply because it might be difficult to sympathize with Harry after that, or even with Kim for allowing the investigation to continue undeterred after watching his partner take the life of an unarmed child. A state is an entity that lays claim to a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence within a given territory. On a day-to-day -day basis, the police are given access to that violence. If violence is a commodity, then the police hold a monopoly on that resource and do not allow it to be shared. The police are permitted to use violence against the people, whereas the people are not permitted to use violence against the police to protect themselves. And if this power dynamic is violated, then the people are met with even greater violence by the police. Because of this monopoly of violence, the police are given an incredible amount of leeway to use violence to meet their goals or even use violence in a manner that does not meet their goals, so long as that violence is employed while on duty, presumably protecting the community. Due to this understood monopoly of violence, as well as propaganda that portrays the police as ultimately good and outright fear of the police, the population generally does not confront the police, either with violence or even passive resistance, despite the fact that the people outnumber the police. Apologists for the police would say that while police shooting unarmed or surrendering people is tragic, it still does not justify militant protests of the police, temporary takeovers of the streets by activists, or riots that happened in response to these shootings. However, this ignores the power dynamics at play. If the police have all the power, this monopoly of violence, what other option do the people have? A peaceful, quiet, candlelight vigil that draws no attention and functions more as a community funeral than an accusation against the police? In Disco Elysium, Harry and Kim encounter anti-police graffiti and lone resistance to the police. Cindy the Skull, for example, passively resists the police, but nothing she does hinders the investigation. Harry and Kim have so much power that any mild resistance to the police bounces off them impotently. Only more active resistance to their efforts prove effective. The people of Baltimore protested and even rioted over a long history of police brutality that finally went too far, and the talking heads sat in their comfortable studios and lamented the loss of what they really cared about, property. Won't somebody think of the property damage? Whatever happened to civility? Demands for civility function primarily to stifle the protests and grievances of those currently facing real harm, in this case the most common victims of police brutality, poor people, and racial minorities. Calls for civility are a smokescreen to allow those in power to continue this brutality. Such civility, a neutrality of both speech and action, is more useful to those currently enjoying the fruits of the status quo than it is useful to those hoping to affect change or bring attention to their oppression. And those calling for civility know this. It is a tactic to suppress protest and to falsely claim that both sides share equal blame for the unequal relationship the goal of discourse about civility is to remove all threats to state power and capital. Raucous protests are condemned, and then they say, protest peacefully. But then when they peacefully protest, those protests are condemned too. The discourse about civility is a con. Apologists for the police will move the goalposts after hearing this and counter with cold pragmatism. 
they will say, does active resistance really do any good in bringing attention to police brutality? Does it result in arrests and convictions of police officers? To answer that, we can look at the case of Oscar Grant. In 2009, police boarded a Bay Area rapid transit train to respond to a call about a fight. They detained several young men, most of them African American. Among these young men was Oscar Grant. Once Grant was lying face down and handcuffed, a police officer named Johannes Messerly fatally shot Grant in the back. The murder was recorded on video from multiple angles, as several witnesses filmed it with their phone cameras. They hid their cameras from the police and posted the recordings on the internet. Shortly thereafter, demonstrations were organized, which then escalated into riots. Police responded with tear gas and more than a hundred arrests. A full year later, the officer was tried and convicted. Not of murder, but of involuntary manslaughter. He was found not guilty of murder and voluntary manslaughter. The police can never be labeled murderers. The general consensus at the time was that the only reason the officer was even arrested was because the people rioted. The riot and the threat of future riots convinced the state to charge the officer. The riots caused significant property damage and added expenses to the city for weeks of extra police protection. To the state, the officer's greatest crime was not shooting an unarmed black man. It was costing the city money. The police exist to protect property, and only if a police officer threatens property can that officer be truly in error. Christian Williams, author of Our Enemies in Blue, Power and Police in America, once wrote, The battles that ensue do not only concern particular injustices, but also represent deep disputes about the rights of the public and the limits of state power. On the one side, the police and the government try desperately to maintain control, to preserve their authority and on the other, oppressed people struggle to assert their humanity. Such riots represent, among other things, the attempt of the community to define for itself what will count as police brutality and where the limit of authority falls. It is in these conflicts, not in the courts, that our rights are established. When the police are recorded brutalizing someone through an excessive use of force or a shooting that is disproportional to the threat, the media tends to individualize the incident and question the actions of the individual police officer or, far more likely, the actions of the victim and what led up to the brutality. Statistics and data compiled for many, many years instead show a pattern of violence, a pattern of forgiveness for the police regardless of their crimes, and a pattern of condemnation for the victims of police violence. The police, no matter what they do, are forgiven because they presumably serve a public good, but the victims of police violence, often vilified in the media as no angels, presumably do not serve a public good and are therefore more expendable than the police. In the United States in 2019, the police killed 1,099 people. 24% of those killed were black despite only being 13% of the U.S. population. Black people are roughly three times more likely to be killed during encounters with the police, despite being roughly one and a half times more likely to be unarmed during these encounters. Apologists for the police will say that the police are only responding to violent crime and that's just where the police are. However, statistics consistently show that levels of violent crime in U.S. cities do not determine rates of police violence. It is demonstrably untrue that police violence is simply an unavoidable result of a comparable violent crime rate. These are only statistics in the United States, and while many Americans mistakenly believe that police violence and police militarization is a uniquely American problem, there is a lot of data that disproves this. Put a pin in that. After Harry's interactions with Kuno and Kuno S, he and Kim examined the body and continued their investigation. Harry and Kim had to search a dumpster, but didn't have the key. I had Harry question the cafeteria manager. He gave up the keys rather quickly, which meant there was no reason for Harry to continue questioning him, but I had him do it anyway. After Harry made his way through this district full of poverty and crime, he found Joyce, the representative of Wild Pines. Criminogenic conditions are the causes of crime, such as poverty leading to theft. Solving criminogenic conditions requires measures that capitalists would label socialism and are therefore not pursued by the state because capitalists have significant influence in the state. Capitalists don't want criminogenic conditions resolved because in order to help more people, the capitalists would have their taxes raised. 
Also, capitalists would no longer have an impoverished citizenry that is reliant on the capitalists and can provide cheap labor. Resolving criminogenic socioeconomic conditions would result in far greater peace and order than the police could ever create. But capitalists prefer the police to maintain order because it maintains the order that allows them to continue getting wealthier rather than an actual order that would help the most people. To put it more simply, police enforcement advantages the wealthy and disadvantages the poor. Since it's the wealthy who make the rules, the state focuses on police enforcement instead of solutions to criminogenic conditions. Wild Pines could solve poverty in Martinet, but they won't. Wild Pines wants enough of the population of Martinet to be poor so that the poor relies on Wild Pines. That is how capitalism functions. Wild Pines also wants the police to protect their interests. Thus, the police function as the armed enforcers of capitalism. Over the course of the investigation, Harry has opportunities to lie to and intimidate witnesses and suspects. If the laws of Martinet are similar to the United States, some of this is legal and some of it is not, but nearly all of it will have no consequences. Remember the cafeteria manager? When Harry insists on seeing the kitchen, I had him pretend he has a search warrant. Police require a warrant to search property in many cases, and if the police officer lies to gain entrance, any evidence the police officer finds will probably be suppressed in court. Again, probably, but not necessarily. Rather than simply lying about a search warrant, which is something the courts can check, police lie in other ways that are impossible to prove unless there is a recording. For example, police can enter a residence if they believe an emergency is occurring inside. Of course, the police could simply lie about believing there is an emergency. Furthermore, consent may be considered invalid if officers mislead the person about who or what they're investigating, but if the officers simply fail to tell a suspect that an inspection could lead to criminal charges, consent will be valid. One needs to consider the power dynamics in both instances. The officers could always lie about the emergency or lie about consent. In either case, due to the authority the police have in society, they will almost certainly be believed over the person who was arrested. This is because society has been led to believe that whatever the police are doing is in the public interest. In their interest. Even if the cops get their hands dirty, it's okay, because dirty cop stuff is still cop stuff. Harry is, according to the text of the game, well-versed in threatening legalese that implies criminal liability but has no meaning whatsoever. This is another way police officers can do what they want. They probably know the letter of the law more than the average civilian and can lie about almost anything. In addition to lying about the law, police officers know that the law itself allows them to lie. The law will always favor law enforcement over suspects. These are some examples from the United States, but similar laws exist elsewhere. These are some of the ways that police can lie to you during an interrogation. Oregon v. Matheson established that the police are allowed to lie about fingerprints. People v. Jones established that the police can lie about DNA. Maryland v. King established that the police are allowed to lie to obtain your DNA. People v. Mays and People v. Smith established that the police can lie to you about polygraph tests. The People v. Dominic established that the police can lie to you about having witnesses. The People v. Sims established that the police can lie about recording conversations. For example, they can say that they are turning the recording device off to have an off-the-record chat with you, but not actually do that. People v. Steger established that the police can lie to you about what will happen to your friends if you don't confess. Basically, threats. Although there are some exceptions to this. People v. Garul established that the police can pretend that they have enough evidence to put that suspect away for a long time, and that confessing is their best way to avoid a lengthy jail sentence. This is all in service of gaining a confession. Even a phony confession. In fact, police can lie about that too. Apologists for the police would no doubt say, well, if the suspect is innocent, why shouldn't the police be allowed to lie to them? To that I say, first, please get that boot out of your mouth. Second, false confessions happen with a high degree of regularity. 
This is because police can trap a suspect with so many lies about what is in their best interest that the suspect may mistakenly believe that confessing to a minor crime is better than what will happen if the suspect does not cooperate. The public at large supports the police in these lies and confessions, presuming an innocence on the part of the police and guilt on the part of the suspect. Presumption of innocence on the part of the police is a big part of why suspects believe their lies about reduced sentences and phony witnesses in the first place. In short, the police are legally allowed to lie to the people about nearly anything, and in the case of illegal lies, they are given the presumption of innocence should that come up in court. Not long ago, a police officer, Amber Geiger, was arrested and convicted of entering the wrong home and killing the owner, Botham Jean. It's not unusual for a police officer to kill someone, but it is unusual for a police officer to be arrested and convicted for it. What was the difference between this and, say, the strangulation and death of Eric Gardner by Officer Daniel Pantelio? Well, in the case of Officer Geiger, she was not performing her duties as a police officer during the killing. She was off duty and coming home. The fact that Geiger is a police officer was incidental. Society found it acceptable for her to be punished for killing Botham Jean. In the case of the death of Eric Garner, the officer was on duty when he needlessly strangled an unarmed man to death. Society found it unacceptable for him to be punished, because even though he was in the wrong, he was on duty when it happened. The police can get away with almost anything so long as they do it while wearing their uniform, because if it happens on duty, then they were only doing cop stuff. Some officers are fired, yes, but very few are arrested, and even fewer are convicted. If a civilian wrongfully kills an unarmed person without a particularly good reason, they are charged for that crime, and statistically speaking, they will probably be convicted if it goes to trial. If a police officer wrongfully kills an unarmed person without a particularly good reason, society grants them a reason. They did it in the line of duty. A police officer only needs to say that they felt threatened to get away with it. They have enough institutional support and public support for this to be deemed acceptable. We have to protect our boys in blue, some people will say. Excuses will be made, and if none are immediately obvious, some excuses will be invented. Anything to hand wave the actions of the police as necessary for our safety. Throughout Disco Elysium, no matter what Harry does, Kim will always look the other way. Here, Harry breaks into an apartment without permission. Kim acknowledges what is happening, but barely raises an eyebrow. Earlier, when Harry took a swing at Kuno, Kim did nothing. Earlier still, when Harry tried to aggressively force a confession out of Gart, Kim only reluctantly takes Harry's side, but he still does it. Kim is a firm believer in the necessity of the police. He mentions this several times. Kim himself will not do much that one might consider dirty, but he allows Harry to do whatever he wants. Within the context of the game, Kim can't impede Harry's progress because that would be impeding the player's progress. Although this function of the game mirrors how much a police officer can get away with and how much other police officers, even if they don't agree with the actions of the dirty cop, will be willing to look the other way. Later in the game, Harry meets a union boss who wants him to intimidate someone. This is obviously well outside the investigation, but because the union boss could help with the investigation if Harry does this, Kim turns a blind eye to it. He will even participate because everywhere Harry goes, Kim follows. Only in the rarest of circumstances, like when Harry considers kicking down an old woman's door, will Kim put his foot down. For the most part, however, Harry can do almost anything with few, if any, legal consequences. Because everything he does in the game is happening while he's on duty, and that's good enough for his partner. Because even dirty cop stuff is cop stuff. At a critical moment in the game, Harry and Kim encounter a standoff between a group of mercenaries and the Hardy Boys, the enforcers of a local union. During my communist run, I had Harry try to reason with both sides of the conflict and to ease tensions. He was not entirely successful, but due to some solid roles and better decisions, both he and Kim made it through alive and continued the case together. During my fascist run, I had Harry be more aggressive, immediately threatening both sides of the conflict. As a communist, Harry's rhetoric skills were much higher, but as a fascist, the odds of settling the disputes with words were similar to the odds of violently escalating the situation in Harry's favor.
In the real world, when in a potentially dangerous situation, police officers know that even though they may not need to draw their firearm, doing so is very tempting. It might get the civilian killed, even if the civilian doesn't pose a threat, but at least the police officer will feel safer. Police officers are generally trained to de-escalate a situation. However, killing a civilian with their firearm is still safer for themselves than not killing a civilian with their firearm, and many police officers, given the opportunity and hardware, will do just that. Americans are sometimes under the false impression that their police carrying firearms is unique due to the prevalence of firearms among citizens and because news media and popular culture often compares U.S. law enforcement usage of firearms to U.K. law enforcement and their usual lack of firearms. However, police across the world generally carry firearms, giving them incredible and lethal power over the citizenry. In Spain, the national police own over 38,000 firearms, the local police own over 37,000, and the Guardia Civil own over 65,000. This arms roughly 83% of total Spanish officers if the weapons were evenly distributed. In Italy, both the Polizia, under the Ministry of the Interior, and the Carabinieri, the military police under the Ministry of Defense, routinely carry Beretta 9 caliber semi-automatic pistols. In France, the National Police, which is responsible for urban areas, and the Gendarmerie, which is responsible for rural areas, equip all their officers with Sig Sauer SP-2022 pistols. Police routinely carry firearms in Australia, Japan, Russia, China, Pakistan, Brazil, Sweden, and almost everywhere else in the world. Very few countries in the world severely restrict law enforcement access to firearms for public safety. Firearms carried by the police in the Republic of Ireland are extremely rare. Police in Norway do have access to firearms, but the manner in which they can use them is severely limited. Norwegian police officers don't carry firearms while on patrol duties, but they do have a firearm locked in their patrol cars. At least in theory, they may only arm themselves with permission from the chief of police. In Iceland, the police generally do not carry firearms except for the special operations team. Although even among the rare countries with generally unarmed law enforcement, there have been moves in recent years to give them greater access to firearms. For example, New Zealand has unarmed police officers, but in recent years, the police association has made several requests for a revision of the force's weapons policy with a proposal to include arming officers. In the United Kingdom, the vast majority of law enforcement does not carry firearms, but there have been moves towards militarization of law enforcement in recent years. In Disco Elysium, there are only a handful of instances in which Harry can draw his weapon on a civilian, and even fewer in which he can actually fire it at that civilian. This is not a game with a normal combat system. The standoff between the mercenaries and the Hardy Boys is one of those rare instances. Will Harry shoot first and ask questions later? How threatened does he need to be in order for the deaths of the mercenaries to be justifiable? Policies and statistics vary from country to country. In a U.S. Supreme Court ruling in 2018, the case of Casilla v. Hughes, the majority of justices concluded that if an officer feels threatened in any way, the officer is virtually always justified. In Sacramento, California, not long ago, police opened fire on Stefan Clark, Two officers, dispatched to investigate a report that someone was breaking car windows, saw Clark in his grandmother's backyard. One officer shouted, Gun! and fired 20 rounds of bullets, eight of which hit Clark. There was no gun. It was a cell phone. A recording proved that Clark showed his hands as asked, and an independent autopsy showed that six of the eight shots that struck Clark were in his back. The two officers muted the audio on their body cams as they discussed what had happened with each other and plotted their cover-up. Still alive for up to 10 minutes, Clark was left to die as the officers did not move to help him. The amount of police shootings and killing vary across the world. In Mexico in 2017, police killed 371 people. In the Congo in 2018, the number is 389. In South Africa, 436. In Bangladesh in 2018, 466. In Pakistan in 2017, 495. In the Philippines in 2017, 3,451. In Brazil in 2018, 6,160. The increasing militarization of the police and police shootings in general is a global problem. The problem is not just the United States of America. 
The problem is the police. In Disco Elysium, Harry learns about himself and discovers that he has killed three people. Kim does not react to this negatively, insisting that this is common for police officers and that Harry might even be one of the good ones, because his tally is so low compared to others. Kim never even inquires about the circumstances of Harry's shootings because Kim is of the mind that Harry must have had a good reason for drawing his weapon. His belief in this has everything to do with Harry being a police officer and therefore trustworthy in his eyes, despite overwhelming evidence leading up to this reveal that Harry is not trustworthy. In the real world, these shootings are allowed to happen without much pushback due to a combination of police intimidation, propaganda, and complicity among more conservative citizens. When a police officer shoots someone, even if they didn't have to, much of the public will defend them, shouting down any opposition with empty arguments that always find fault with the victim and not with the police officer who escalated the situation. After all, it was done in the line of duty. Cop stuff, remember? In the case of Stefan Clark, enough people will say, well, a cell phone could be mistaken for a firearm, as if the police officer's mistake was somehow the fault of the victim. Enough people will say, he was no angel, Digging into his past and this incident, searching for any justification or any reason to hand-wave the incident so that the police are not at fault. Police officers can be caught on camera shooting children holding toys and still not be found at fault by much of the population. When citizens rightly protest police shootings, enough people will say, Oh, they'll call the police if they're in trouble, as if that's the point. As if we have to accept thousands of police shootings over the world in order to protect our car stereos. Enough people will say, well, the victim did something illegal, as if any crime is justification for their death. Eric Garner may or may not have been selling cigarettes, but even if that were definitely the case, that is not a capital offense. Back to my fascist run and the standoff. I increased Harry's odds of making an unprovoked shot, but still failed the check. Tried again, and made the improbable check. Harry escalated the problem, and he was unable to dodge the bullet. A failed authority check later, and Kim was shot by the mercenaries. In my communist run, Kim helped patch Harry up, and continued the investigation. In my fascist run, Kim was removed from the game, presumably alive for the time being in a hospital, but he is never seen again. Harry shot first. He was not responding to a shooting. Nevertheless, apologists for the police use real-world incidences like this as evidence to defend them. They will say, well, what about police officers who are shot and killed? Out of fairness, this should be acknowledged. According to Officer Down, in 2019, 48 police officers in the United States were shot and killed in the line of duty through intentional gunfire by suspects. This is undoubtedly heartbreaking for the families of these officers, but this is also a very small number compared to the amount of people in the United States shot and killed by police officers. The police fatally shot 1,099 people in 2019. 1,099 to 48. Apologists would try to boost these numbers by adding other on-duty deaths unrelated to suspects like heart attacks and illnesses and training accidents, but even with all that added to the totals, it still would not even be close. Nowhere near the 1,099 people who were killed by police in 2019 in the United States. And again, that's only the U.S., any loss of life is tragic to their families, and police officers do encounter danger. But based on these extremely lopsided numbers, it's not the police who are in the most danger. It's everyone else. Many people are not willing to believe that the police are at fault when someone is shot, even if the victim is innocent and unarmed, because doing so forces them to acknowledge that the police are not there for their protection. And that can be terrifying. So... What can we do about this? Throughout the game, Harry is called a pig by various people around Martinet, and his feelings about that are dictated by the player. In my communist run, Harry came to identify with those who would call him a pig and disassociate with the police entirely. In my fascist run, obviously, he was way more into his violent authority. 
The letters ACAB sometimes confuse people who don't have much interest in police reform or police abolition, not only because they can't imagine a society functioning any other way, but because the all cops part makes the statement seem to target individual cops. It does not. Whether or not an individual police officer is a good or bad person is not relevant. Mistrust of the police, the political movement of police abolition, and the letters ACAB themselves have nothing whatsoever to do with individual police officers and everything to do with the system with which these police officers participate and prop up. Disco Elysium asks what kind of cop are you and allows you to make lots of choices for Harry. However, the game never allows you to not be a cop at all. The narrative is about a police investigation. The only way to not be a cop in Disco Elysium is to not play Disco Elysium. Communist Harry might be a better human being than Fascist Harry, but any Harry is a cop. A bad cop might get a perverse, racist thrill out of harassing minorities, and a good cop might not. But that same good cop must still enforce laws that disproportionately punish minorities. A bad cop might come from an affluent background and despise the poor, and a good cop might not. But the good cop is still enforcing laws that favor the rich and control the poor. Bad cop, good cop, they are both part of the same bad institution. Whether or not it's a good thing for good cops to be part of the force to balance out the bad cops is irrelevant because while there are obvious varying degrees of bad behavior among individual police officers, the system of policing itself, meaning enforcing capitalism and controlling the poor, is inherently damaging. During police training, individuals are not told that they are there to serve capital and to prevent the working class from organizing, but that is what the police end up doing anyway. It's not a secret conspiracy, it's just the result of the existence of the police. What the laws instruct the police to predominantly serve, and the role of the police within our current economic system. Apologists for the police sometimes bring up the fact that any profession comes with it some risk that one's actions indirectly benefit a bad system. But there are two problems with this. First, again, the opposition is to the system of modern policing, not some individual's microscopic contribution to it. And second, even if we were to take the individual approach, there is no comparison to a police officer who disagrees with some aspects of modern policing and, say, a Walmart greeter who disagrees with the owners of Walmart. The Walmart greeter might indirectly, in some five degrees of Kevin Bacon kind of way, assist capitalists in some marginal, barely visible manner, but that ignores the fact that it is unavoidable to participate in capitalism while capitalism exists. So long as capitalism is the economic system under which we all live, we cannot opt out of having a profession under capitalism. On the other hand, a police officer does more than simply have a profession, like we all do. A police officer far more directly enforces the law in service of the marriage of state and capitalism. A police officer can take away the freedom and even the life of a civilian with little to no consequences for themselves. A Walmart greeter cannot do that. Also, while it is true that we must have a profession, there is nothing that forces us to have this profession. Saying there is no ethical consumption under capitalism does not dismiss the existence of the police, nor does it excuse those who choose to directly participate in modern policing. Having a job? No choice. Having this job in particular? A choice. Now, how much personal responsibility one applies to an individual police officer for choosing their profession is a matter of some debate. But since the problem is the system and not the individual, it is not particularly relevant to this conversation. I only bring it up to dispute it. In short, the problem is not Harry or Kim or your real-world police officer relative who you swear on a stack of Bibles is a really nice guy. The problem is the institution to which police officers are employed and serve. The police abolition movement does not seek a society without law or law enforcement. It only seeks to replace the current modern centralized system of policing and or employ radical changes to that system. There are two categories of change related to the police. The first category is limited change that can happen within our current economic system and current centralized police that could theoretically happen right now if there were enough public support. 
The second category is massive change that would be far more effective but probably won't happen overnight. So we should probably advocate for both because everything that could minimize harm is worth doing. First category first, reforms that might help at least a little. Police officers in many parts of the world do not go through extensive training. In the United States, for example, prospective police officers train for an average of 19 weeks before being given a lethal weapon and told to patrol the city looking for bad guys. It takes four years of university, as well as a series of qualifying classes, to become a kindergarten teacher. It takes seven years to become a surgeon. It only takes a few months to become responsible for the incredible authority to take away the freedom or life of a civilian in a society that presumes that authority is almost never wrong. Police training lasts about as long as one semester of university. Imagine passing one course, Psychology 101, and being given a doctorate and a private practice at the end of the semester. For the police, that's the gap between training and utilizing that training. Rutgers University sociology professor Paul Hirschfield once said of this, If you only have 19 weeks of training, you're going to spend those on the most essential things. Unfortunately, in the United States, it's about what you need to defend yourself how you're going to avoid getting hurt. If you have three years, you can also learn how to protect people, how to avoid these situations from arising in the first place. It fosters a whole different orientation and culture in law enforcement. If police officers are dedicating their entire careers, their entire working lives, to the force, they should at least receive proper training. And most of that training should be about protecting others, not protecting themselves, as that gives them the impression that their lives are more important than civilians, and that drawing a weapon at the slightest provocation is considered acceptable if it's in the service of self-protection. Police accountability departments and internal affairs should be handled exclusively by civilians, not the police themselves. The conflict of interest is obvious. Internal affairs is just more cops. There are countless other potential reforms to the police, and the feasibility should at least be investigated. In addition to reforms to the police as an institution, criminogenic laws and circumstances should be reformed. Marijuana and ownership of small quantities of drugs should be decriminalized, and the drug problem should be treated predominantly as a health matter and not a legal matter. Private prisons should be abolished, as they incentivize legislation that fills them up. The criminal justice system should be completely reformed, and mandatory minimums should be abolished. These reforms could give the police significantly less authority over our lives. Toward the end of Disco Elysium, Harry and his partner, either Kim or Kuno, set off for a nearby island to confront the murderer and close the case. Spoilers, I guess. I had Harry confront Yosef, a communist who had seen his dreams fade with the victory of capitalism. During my fascist run, every nonsensical fascist slogan Harry said resulted in him losing morale. It took several tries, and a few deaths, to get to the conclusion. During my communist run, Harry tried to get along with him, but he rejected Harry. The police are a tool of capitalism. There are several problems with mere reforms to the police. One problem is that the police are incredibly resistant to reforms. Adding body cameras to police officers sounded like a helpful reform until we realized that police officers can, and do, put their hand over their camera or just turn off either the video or audio when convenient. Another problem is that reforms can simply be rolled back under a new administration or new representatives. The concept of police reform suggests that the police, as agents of capitalism, is some flaw in the system when in reality this is the system functioning as it was intended. Capitalists wanted there to be a centralized police force who protected their interests, and that's what happened. We should advocate for anything that has even a chance of protecting civilians from the police, but we also need to recognize that the police maintaining their current level of unquestioned authority will abuse that authority and that the police under capitalism are always going to be the enforcers of capitalism. For example, added training will undoubtedly help, but calls for training as a cure-all ignore certain facts. Eric Garner did not die because the police officer accidentally used the wrong hold. He died because the police officer casually disregarded his plea that he could not breathe. Police are told time and time again that they are invincible to public scrutiny, above the law, and superior to those they are harassing. 
Worse still, they are told that the people they are harassing for suspicion of petty crimes are in need of this harassment. It's broken windows policing, meaning targeting low-level infractions and relatively harmless vice with aggressive, intensive, and violent enforcement. According to Alex S. Vitale, author of The End of Policing, Broken Windows Policing is at root a deeply conservative attempt to shift the burden of responsibility for declining living conditions onto the poor themselves and to argue that the solution to all social ills is increasingly aggressive, invasive, and restrictive forms of policing that involve more arrests, more harassment, and ultimately more violence. As inequality continues to increase, so will homelessness and public disorder. And as long as people continue to embrace the use of police to manage disorder, we will see a continual increase in the scope of police power and authority at the expense of human and civil rights. Broken windows policing is more philosophy than policy and is therefore difficult to root out. Other reforms like special prosecutors and civilian accountability departments still face major hurdles to doing their job due to a lack of cooperation from the police. In short, there are limits to reform due to the incredible power that the police are given. That means the only way to circumvent this is by taking away much of their power, replacing the modern police with something else. This is only a radical proposal if one mistakenly believes that the modern centralized police is an institution that has always existed. It has not. Capitalism and the police as we know it are both relatively recent inventions. Demanding a replacement in law enforcement and community safety is no more radical than the last major replacement in law enforcement and community safety in the 1830s. The only difference is that it was the wealthy, the capitalists, who demanded this change to serve their interests, whereas now it is the people who demand a change to serve our interests. Incremental reform can only take us so far, and at some point we need to have the political will to make another radical change. What would the replacement for the police look like? How would it function? One alternative is for most activities that do not need to be handled by the police be separated into professional departments that are specifically trained to solve problems without harsh punishment. In Disco Elysium, there are at least two instances in which Harry must act as negotiator and mental health expert. Ruby, a suspect, threatens to kill herself, and another civilian, nicknamed The Pigs, is having a mental health emergency. Yet, it is up to Harry to prevent any harm, despite the fact that he is not a mental health expert. He himself is having a week-long mental health emergency. The police are given a broad directive to maintain order in their community, and because of this, they are called to quell any disturbances. When the police respond to someone acting erratic, they don't know what to say or what to do. They're not doctors, they're police. They may be trained to de-escalate a situation, but that still does not make them mental health experts. The police are not called to put out fires, the fire department is called. Why are the police dispatched to handle mental health emergencies? Mental health emergencies should not be handled by the police. A separate, unaffiliated institution should be responsible for handling these emergencies. Why are the police called when a homeless person is sleeping on a bench or loitering? Why not dispatch someone who works at a homeless shelter or someone who is there to help the homeless person? Shooing away the homeless person does not benefit the homeless. It benefits more fortunate people who have decided that they just don't want to look at homeless people so much that they will call the police just to avoid making eye contact with them. Look, nobody is demanding working class people house complete strangers in their already occupied studio apartments. But there is an abundance of empty housing that goes unused owned by the rich. A society that does not even have proper, safe shelters and other forms of care for the homeless is failing at being a society. The state gives the police the job of shooing away the homeless instead of funding a system to take care of the homeless. The police being responsible for dealing with the homeless gives the community the impression that if the homeless are a police matter, then the homeless are inherently dangerous. The blame is shifted onto the victims of society and not the structure of society itself that makes such victims. The police does not shoo away a homeless person from their park bench because they have evidence that this individual homeless person is dangerous. If they did, that homeless person would be arrested in light of that evidence. 
The police are directed to disperse homeless people from public places because the rich make the laws, and the rich don't have any use for people with no money, and the homeless are an eyesore for people with money. Drug enforcement can be largely abolished and transferred to a department that would treat drug problems as a public health matter, and not a putative matter that statistically is not solved by jail sentences. The police are given many tasks which have little to do with law enforcement and everything to do with maintaining commerce in a community. If the job can be done by someone who is not a cop, then a cop should not be called. For all the reasons mentioned in the earlier section, police should be demilitarized and gradually disarmed. Apologists for the police would say that police need to be armed in a country with a potentially armed population, but in Iceland, where there are an estimated 90,000 guns in a population of only 323,000, the police are unarmed and the country has one of the lowest global crime rates in the world. Even if that were not true, the police as an institution has consistently proven itself irresponsible as an armed force. We don't give this many chances to violent offenders. There is no reason to keep giving more and more chances for the police to one day be responsible with their firearms. What remains of the police would be highly trained detectives for major crimes, like homicide, and a rotating community patrol for everything else, populated with temporary members so as to remove any above-the-law privileges that officers believe they have. It should go without saying that this new law enforcement would not be armed. This would resolve a lot of the issues related to the police as an authoritarian force while still maintaining community safety. Some combination of these alternatives might make the most sense. What we would call this does not really matter. If it makes people comfortable, we can still call them the police, but they would be so functionally different that a rebranding might be in order. Just as law enforcement prior to the police were called the watch, and before that something else, and so forth. Would it work? There is no crystal ball, but we do know one thing. The current system of policing does not work, which means alternatives must be explored. The biggest threat to the people and the biggest influence on police power is that the wealthy control the politicians, and the politicians control the law. The only way to resolve that is for people to be unable to hoard the vast majority of the wealth on the planet. The wealthy create greater and greater disparity and income inequality. If wealth creates influence, and the wealthy have more and more influence in the law, then everyone else has less and less influence in the law. That means the law will always favor the wealthy and maintain the wealthy over everyone else, unless there is no more income inequality. Unless there is no more capitalism. Again from Alex S. Vitale. We must break these intertwined systems of oppression. Every time we look to the police and prisons to solve our problems, we reinforce these processes. We cannot demand that the police get rid of those annoying homeless people in the park or the threatening young people on the corner and simultaneously call for affordable housing and youth jobs because the state is only offering the former and will deny us the latter every time. Yes, communities deserve protection from crime and even disorder, but we must always demand those without reliance on the coercion, violence, and humiliation that undergird our criminal justice system. The state may try to solve those problems through police power, but we should not encourage or reward such short-sighted, counterproductive, and unjust approaches. We should demand safety and security, but not at the hands of the police. In the end, they rarely provide either. At the end of Disco Elysium, Harry and the suspect talk about the capitalists taking over and the dream of a better world only being a memory. They had their chance, and they blew it. But that does not mean that we won't get another chance to change the world. Economic systems are replaced by new economic systems over the course of history. I don't have a three-step plan to overthrow capitalism. I'm an educator, not an organizer. But I know enough about history to see that there is going to be an opportunity to make that radical change. The police can't be the enforcers of capitalism if there is no capitalism anymore. Hi everyone. If you want to learn more, the sources are cited in the description. Many of the sources were also quoted in the video, particularly The End of Policing by Alex S. Vitale, Our Enemies in Blue by Christian Williams, The History of Policing in the United States by Dr. Gary Potter, and The Origins of Capitalism by the Brighton Solidarity Federation. Each text was very helpful in the creation of this video.